I've been working a lot from home recently and that got me thinking. If I can work from home, I can probably work from anywhere. So I bought a used cargo van and the plan is to convert it into an off-grid office so that I can travel around my home country of New Zealand this summer while still getting my work done. So allow me to introduce my 2012 medium wheelbase high roof Volkswagen Crafter. It has two doors at the back, one sliding door and nothing inside. But what it lacks in interior decor, it makes up for in um, surface rust and lichen. But let's have future me worry about that one because right now I want to get the interior lining stripped out so we can have a clear view of what we're working with. The cab partition gets the boot as well because that's going to give us a lot more usable space. And after peeling back the carpet and removing the old floor, despite the dust and the dirt, everything's actually looking really good. If I asked you to picture what a van looks like in your head, chances are you might think of a box on wheels. Yeah, they're anything but. Every surface is curved, every side is different, and none of these shapes are nice square rectangles. So what I'm trying to say is that taking accurate measurements to build off, yeah, it's, it's a real chore. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm all for hard work when it needs to be done, but man, if there's potential for a way to work smarter, well... So here we are in a program called Meshroom and what it's done is it's stitched together all the 418 photos I took into a relatively accurate point cloud using a process called photogrammetry. And after I've exported that out I've now got myself a 3D mesh model of my van. Yeah it's got a few artifacts but from what I can tell from my reference marks the main structure is within a few millimeters or so of real life which is more than good enough at the planning stage. In my extensive research on Instagram, I found the most common layout is a fixed bed across the back. It's easy to construct and gives you an excellent utility area that you can access from the rear doors like a car boot. But I'm not going to do it that way. This van is 1.8 meters wide and I'm 1.8 meters tall and I don't want to have squished toes. I could always turn the bed long ways but now the van is more bed than space and I'm basically just driving a bed around. So the way I've chosen to do this is to make a pull out sofa bed down the side here so that during the day I'm not losing all of that space. There's going to be a kitchen module on the opposite side with a fold out table going out the sliding door. And then I've got a ton of room at the rear here for a large desk that I can comfortably work at because that's kind of the point of all of this. I'm also going to need an extraction fan here and a small window on the side would be nice. But before we do that, I do need to deal with the exterior. Honestly, it's, it's not that bad. A little bit of gardening, a little bit of washing, a little more washing. More washing. Alright, this is taking too long. There's a couple of areas with a bit of surface rust, so I took them back to bare metal and gave them a quick repaint. There's also a ton of little stone chips that are starting to get rusty. This probably has something to do with the van being used as a rally car support vehicle by its previous owners because it looks like it spent a lot of time on gravel roads. But hey, that didn't take too long. Oh. I feel like I should mention though, despite the few cosmetic blemishes, the van itself is in good mechanical condition. I took it to get a full service done the day after I bought it, and do you know what they replaced? The cabin air filter. They didn't even need to do an oil change. So I'm hopeful the effort that I put in now will be worth it in the end, and I'm not just, you know, putting lipstick on a pig. All right, everything's cleaned up now, both inside and out. It's time to start the actual build. First on are the roof rails, except they're not actually roof rails, the lengths of Unistrut, because you guys know how much I love working with slotted channels. Ah, the versatility. But they're gonna go into the grooves on the roof here, and these little circles, yeah, they're actually little caps covering holes that go into the van. So if I mark their location on the Unistrut, then drill holes in it, the idea is that I should be able to bolt it straight on. To get the caps off though, I'm delicately extracting the retaining clips on the inside. Then using a heat gun to soften the chewing gum they were apparently sealed down with. I also made a bunch of rubber spaces because the rail needs to clear the panel seams on the van so they actually sit flat. Okay, you ready for a recipe for a roof rail watertight sandwich? First the sealant goes around the hole, then the rubber spacer goes on, then the rail, then more sealant, and finally the stainless steel bolts. All right, go ahead. 
Pro tip, you're gonna need two people to tighten these up unless you have really long arms. But if you get your helper to go up the ladder with the ratchet, all you have to do is stand there holding the spanner. Yeah. Well, with the roof rails on now, I guess first thing in the morning, it's time to cut a huge hole in my roof and install the extraction fan. Except it's kind of raining, so I'm gonna remove the headliner instead. Huh, look at that. All right, now for the roof fan. Yeah, it's still raining and this radio doesn't have Bluetooth, so out you go. I've got a new one with a reversing camera ordered, but let's come back to that because the rain stopped. Okay, so the idea with this roof fan is that you can use it as an extractor to pull air through while you're cooking or just cool things down on the inside with a bit of airflow. It's got a couple of parts to it, but for installation, the main one I need to worry about right now is this collar, which goes through the roof. I also made this wooden support frame which gives the collar something meaty to screw into and doubles as a template for the hole I need to cut. Which I centered over this very conveniently shaped part of the roof. It's almost like Volkswagen had thought people might want to add fans to these roofs. Yeah, nice one Volkswagen. I lined up the frame with the four corner holes I drilled and prepped for the cut by adding masking tape around the outside so the base of the jigsaw doesn't scratch up the paint. Then drilled holes for the blades to fit through. Now, I've cut metal a bunch of times with a jigsaw, but there is a special feeling of quiet terror when you do it to the most expensive thing you've ever owned. It's that little voice telling you that this is gonna be a real pain to fix if you did it wrong, but it was okay. Everything was fine. But with the rain rolling back in, I called it quits for the day. The next morning, I opened it back up and got to work getting the edges filed smooth and sealed with primer. Once that had dried, the collar could go on, which fit perfectly, kinda, not really, but it only needs a little notching so it fits over the ribs snugly. There, much better. I'm clamping the wooden frame and the collar together in their final position and starting the holes off with a self-centering drill bit before fully drilling through the steel of the roof and into the wooden frame. My decorative frosting skills get some practice. And then the collar gets lined back up with a screw to hold it in position while I fit the support frame from underneath. Then it's all screwed down together, clamping the roof between the collar and the wood frame. The edge of the collar then gets another full perimeter of sealant because I'd really rather water than get in there. And a little trick I learned from a friend of mine who's a plumber is that if you spray sealant down with soapy water and then spray your finger as well, it doesn't stick to you and you can get nice clean edges. With the sun getting low, all that's left to do is attach the actual fan unit to the collar with a couple of screws and remove the plastic. I can't really test it yet until I've done the power system, so let's move on to the next item on the list. Again, I've made a wooden support frame and to get this to sit flat, I'm gonna have to remove this piece of bracing which is a little tricky because I need to cut deep enough, but not so deep that I go through the wall. It's also bonded with what looks like industrial hot glue, which after softening with the heat gun, peels off in a very satisfying way. From here, the process was pretty much the same as the roof vent. Mark the hole, drill through from the inside, line it back up on the outside, mask up, drill holes big enough for the blade to fit through, start cutting it out with the jigsaw, and ignore the quietly screaming voice in the back of your head telling you that you probably cut it in the wrong place. But I hadn't, except those smiles were short lived because my masking tape had developed a mild case of spontaneous disintegration which led to one of the most frustrating hours of my entire life. But we move on, and with the edge of the steel all prepped, it's time to install the window. I'm going to temporarily hold the support frame in with double sided tape while I lay a healthy bead of sealant around the flange of the window. The install is probably easier with two people, one on the outside holding the window and one on the inside screwing it in, but you know, if you don't have any friends, you can still make it work, despite being a klutz. And then 
you drop it on the floor. These windows are designed to go in caravans and motorhomes which have much thicker walls. So having the support frame gives the clamping fixtures something to grab instead of just the thin metal of the van. And for cleaning up the squeeze out, it's the same trick with the soapy water. So I've just installed the window and I was playing with the, the latches here and just opening and closing it and I noticed a wee bit of a problem. So to the left here, the, the seam, the seal is good. We're nice and tight there. But to the right, the seam is uh, less, less than good. If you can see it there, we've got a gap in that corner. Um, now I can close it up with this latch, but I'm, I'm putting a lot of force on it and there's a lot of bending happening on this latch which I'm not a fan of. So it's getting dark and I need to make a decision whether I'm gonna pull this window out and fix it or just, just live with it. I pulled it out and nothing says fun like cleaning sealant off in the dark. The next morning though, I put my detective's hat on to try and figure out what was going on. Initially, I just thought maybe it was the curvature of the van causing the gap, seeing how flat windows generally work best on flat surfaces, but after a few hours of head scratching and running through every possible option, I found this. The double glazed window pane. Yeah, it, it was about as flat as a potato chip. I contacted the seller and they agreed to send me out a new window. So after a few days, this showed up on my doorstep, apparently having been mauled by a bear. And it was also the wrong size. So about a week and a half later, after finally getting an undamaged, correct size window, I could finally finish installing it. And after double checking the seals, check and check, we can call it done. Ah, that was a that was a fun adventure, wasn't it? But moving on, before I start installing the subfloor, I need to do a little bit of prep work. There's a bunch of holes going through the bottom of the van from where the old plywood floor was screwed down, so they all need sealing up. There's also a common issue with this type of van leaking water through these panel clips. So they all get a good squirt with the gunk gun, and then any scuffs and bare patches get a coat of paint to make sure we don't have any um, developing issues in the future. I bought 12mm plywood for the floor, and while I technically only need three sheets, I I bought a few extra because if I don't, I'm going to mess something up and just end up driving back to the store anyway. And the subfloor framing is going to be made from these 2x4s which I'm ripping in half. A quick check to make sure I still had headroom and then I started laying out the subfloor framing. Because there's a chance it might meet moisture, I'm using treated timber which here in New Zealand has dyed this lovely pink colour. It's, it's a delicate balance between putting enough structure in that the floor doesn't flex but not so much that you can't get a good amount of insulation in. So I'm gonna try favor areas that I know are gonna have more weight over them and then leave other areas more open. I really don't wanna put more holes in the bottom of the van again, so I'm using a little combo trick of super strong double-sided tape and construction adhesive to hold the battens in place. Hmm. I thought the old floor looked really good, so I decided to put that back in. No, I'm kidding. I'm just going to use it as a base for my new template. I mean, why reinvent the wheel, right? I'm laying out the plywood for the new floor so I can just trace over it with the old floor. And then it's just a matter of cutting it all out. Before a couple of coats of finish. And while that's drying, let's jump over to the wheel wells. I'd done a quick mock-up in CAD, so I transferred that onto cardboard so I could double check that the fit was all good. And then I could use those cardboard panels as a template to transfer over to the plywood. And finished it off with a few coats of polyurethane. There was still a little bit of time left in the day, so I jumped into a chore that had been bugging me for a while. Someone was either trying to grow a terrarium, or nobody had ever cleaned under here in the van's 10 years of existence. The next morning, it's time to rip into the insulation, and I'm going to be using sheep's wool insulation throughout this build. I mean, I come from New Zealand, right? What else would I use? But no, obviously I did do a bunch of research before deciding on that, and maybe that's a topic for another time. 
The roll comes standard for 2x4 framing, which is why I split it like that, and I found just snipping through with a pair of sewing scissors actually made pretty short work of it. I say short work, but this, this actually took me like a good half day to split, trim and fit all these pieces. The floor's dry now, so in it goes. Man, I was having an absolute doozy trying to get this floor panel in, uh, but then I realised I'd forgotten to cut the gap for the electrical conduit that I'd run under the floor. So after doing that, unsurprisingly, it, it went in a lot easier. Where I'm going to fit the wheel well covers, I installed a wooden spacer block, and while the adhesive cures on those guys, let's jump over and fasten the floor panels down. I'd marked on the edges where all the floor battens were, so all I had to do was run tape between those marks to get a straight line reference for where the screws needed to go. Yeah, nice. And now the final task of the day is to install the wheel well covers by screwing them down to those spacer blocks and also to the floor. Yeah, you know that feeling you get when you're like, ah, I'm forgetting something, but also it's the end of the day, so you're just like, eh. I'm sure it was nothing important. Yeah, it, it was the insulation. I'd forgotten to put the insulation inside them. All right, that's all I've got for part one. I am a couple of weeks ahead in the build to what I have edited here. And man, I can't wait to show you the next one. Uh, I'm gonna design that pull out sofa bed and build a full off grid electrical system, which is something I've been wanting to do for years and I can't wait to share it with you. If you have any questions, comments, uh, favorite sandwiches, leave them below. And if you wanna help me appease the YouTube algorithm, a like and subscribe is very much appreciated. I'll see you on the next one.